Why resist the conscience and the courage of rescues of Jews during the Holocaust? If that phone going off was His Holiness the Pope, tell him I indicated I'm with First Prince tonight and I cannot be available to respond. If it is the actress Sophia Vergara from Modern Family, take a number. <laughs> okay. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And connecting two buildings there, the visitor center over to the actual museum, is an avenue called the Avenue of the Righteous Among the Nations. Yeah, thank you for turning the lights down. Anything to help my photography look acceptable is very deeply appreciated. And the Avenue of the Righteous is along the right-hand side. 27,000 persons are recognized along that avenue of the righteous among the nations that got Vashem. Now 27,000, that seems like a lot of people, and it, and it is. That's more than the population of Greenwood, South Carolina. When I moved here two years ago, the population of Greenwood was 22,221. And the mayor told me that I was 22,222. So even more persons than the community of Greenwood are recognized as rescuers. That seems like a large number. But then you start thinking about the whole population of Europe at the time, and that's half of one hundredth of one percent. That would be one person out of 20,000 chose to be a rescuer. Golda Meir, the former Prime Minister of Israel, said the rescuers were like, and I'll quote her, drops of love in an ocean of poison. So, whereas Hitler and his henchmen, we've talked about them, we've talked about them at some length, and so many others, because remember, what was pulled off could not have been pulled off unless there was a lot of collaboration among different segments of the society, even including the church at some moments, and also the university. That's painful for me as a former professor, and also as a Christian, also a clergy person, because that means that the things could not have pulled off unless there was some complicity among the churches and some cooperation among people at the university. Never forget the machinery of the effective killing in concentration camps was really the result of the best minds at the university. So, whereas what we've talked about a lot during our time together bears witness to brutality and murder and making persons what? Intervention that is subhuman. The rescuers of Jews bear witness to goodness. And Tamara and I were talking before the presentation tonight and she said, you know, we need to hear a lot about the rescuers who bear witness to goodness. It wasn't all evil and bad and horrible and terrible. There was goodness as well. And Abraham Foxman, who directed the ADL for a long time, is the one who has advocated what is called bearing witness to goodness. And he himself, as I've noted for you there, so you knew something about his personal history, his Roman Catholic nanny hid him and saved him during the Holocaust. When you're at the Alphat Shem, you can see an incredible number of photographs that begin to point to those victims of the Holocaust. But why? Why did those rescuers of Jews do what they did? I mean, in, in almost all the cases, it was not in their best interest to do so. It put them at risk, it put their families at risk, put their neighborhoods at risk. For example, if, if you were a person who was resisting, and they couldn't capture you and torture you, they'd go after your family. They couldn't get your family, they'd come into your neighborhood, and every house on a corner would have the persons dragged out and shot in the street and left there. And remember the story I told you about Father Maximilian Kolbe, the Polish priest who learned through the Polish underground he was on the hit list that they were going to come and get him, if he tried to escape, they would take it out, not on his family, his priest, but on his parishioners. 
So he stayed in place, was arrested, and you know the rest of the story, sacrificed his life to save another person who was destined for murder. So where did their altruism, their, their other directedness, their, their, their conscience, their courage, where did it come from? Well, as I said to you before, Jewish scholar uh, Eva Vogelmann has studied the question. She interviewed 3,000 rescuers when they were still alive. And her work has been published as a book called Conscience and Courage. And there it is. Came out about 30 years ago. It's on your reading list. And she came up with four motivations. That is, based on these interviews of 3,000 people, they seem to fall into categories. And there were four motivations for rescuers to save Jews. Now, I gotta tell you right off, it's not as neat and tidy as four separate categories. Some persons we're gonna talk about, really, the, the categories overlap. And they did it for more than just one moral reason. So, reflecting the work of the Swiss psychologist uh, Jean Piget, he talks about what's called heteronymous morality, and that is, well, he specialized in child development, right? And how kids cognitively developed, how also morality became a part of that cognitive development. And he said when kids are little, what really influences them are parents and other adults, right? So it's a kind of heteronymous morality. Adult authority provides guidelines for moral behavior among children. But then he said, as people get older, there's something called autonomous morality. That is, their values and their conscience seem to be uh, self-sustaining and not always so dependent on other person's approval. You know, sometimes you have to do the right thing, whether other people agree with you or not, right? And so if you have autonomous morality, then you do the, the thing that you believe is correct. So typically, Eva Fogelman showed, rescuers launch those rescuing attempts, those rescuing actions, after being asked to help, isn't that interesting? Or after an encounter with suffering or death that awakened their consciences. And I'll call that to mind for you very, very briefly. The American Schindler, right? Remember him? Varian Fry, a Harvard grad, diplomat, author, right? Who had a terrible, unsettling experience in Germany when he was serving there. And that caused him to get involved, get a passport, not from the State Department, they wouldn't give it to him because we wanted to be neutral. Got his passport through Eleanor Roosevelt, because FDR wouldn't do it. And he went over to Marseille and saved 2,000 Jews. So he's an example of someone who had the experience of seeing people beaten on the streets in a German city. And that then opened his conscience up, and he did something about it. We mentioned Le, Le Chambon sur Lignon, and we mentioned the truck maze, that, that is uh, Magda and Andre on the right, little village of uh, 5,000 people who saved 5,000 Jews. They would never call them Jews, they called them Old Testaments. And so the word went around the community, there are more Old Testaments coming and they need a place to be. That was the signal we needed to find places for Jews. In homes, in the countryside, in barns, etc., etc. Magda Trokme, that is Andre's wife, is an example of someone with autonomous morality. And she said, well, come in. The, the Old Testaments, have, they have to come in. Not, not to do that wouldn't be right. But where did that come from? More about that in a second. The, the book in which he talks about doing the right thing and getting that from some source of morality is called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. It's on your list by Philip Haley. Philip Haley. A powerful, powerful, powerful book. Anyway, what they discovered, what Fogelman discovered, is that the rescuer's morality was of three types. Ideological, 
religious, and emotional. I want to talk about those a little bit. <clears throat> First of all, ideological morality is really based on the rescuer's ethical beliefs and their sense of justice. And responding as they did to persons who were having their lives at risk was just simply consistent with their value system that they had had for their entire lives. Sometimes that could be religiously motivated, but, but not always. Pastor Kyle said a couple weeks ago in a sermon, he reminded us that persons who are not necessarily religious, that does not mean that they're not necessarily good. You, you can be a good person and not be religious. Now, for me as a religious person myself, I think there's a dimension and an opportunity that's missed there, but, but you can still be a, a good person. I communicate with one of my best friends uh, at Westminster College today in Missouri because of Dean that we both enjoyed uh, died this week. And my friend is a, an atheist. He and I have very different worldviews, right? But he's one of the finest and most exemplary persons I know. But he, of course, my grandma, he ain't religious. <laughs> but he's still good. So ideological, you could be informed by religion, right, your value system, or it could be a more humanitarian point of view that was informing your morality. Then religious morality, based on religious tenets, such as the golden rule, do unto others as you will have others do unto you, a rule, by the way, that's found in all the religions of the world, not just Christianity. You can find it in Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shinto, etc., etc. These religious values often include, included tolerance for people who are different. Think about that for a second. These points of view included tolerance for persons who are different, who aren't exactly like us. As one example, I would show you this picture I took of the Protestant church in Le Chambon, which is in uh, south, south of France. And please remember, this particular church was a group of Protestants Right, in French it's called Huguenot, right? Huguenot, Huguenots. Living in a Catholic majority country. And they knew what it was like to suffer discrimination and persecution because they were Protestants, right? So the church that the Trocmes pastor is this particular church. And well, I'm not sure you can see it. I wish my photograph was better. Can you see the right hand picture of the door? It says, Aimez-vous les uns les autres. That is in French, love one another. Love one another. Direct passage from John chapter 15, verse 12. So, Le Chambon was influenced by religious morality. A second kind of, I say a third kind of uh, morality is emotional morality. And that would be rescuers who felt compassion for the victims of Nazi persecution, and that compelled them to help. And she found that was the rarest type, it was the smallest number of moral rescuers in her research. And a little postscript, women of the group this evening, psychologist Carol Gilligan from Harvard indicated in her research that members of this group tended to be women rather than men. That motivation number one, morality, right? Motivation number two is what we might call uh, Judeophiles. That is, there were non-Jews whose rescue activity grew out of either a special feeling or a love for individual Jews or Jews as a group. And I'll say more about that in just a second when I talk about Oscar Schindler, with whom you're familiar because we talked about him in a previous presentation, and his plan accountant, Yitzhak Stern, who was indeed Jewish. This group, in her research, was the second largest motivational category behind the three forms of uh, morality among the rescuers that she interviewed. So here's a photo of Oscar Schindler on the right, and Isaac Stern on the left, and of course Isaac Stern was Jewish, Schindler's connection with him in no small way influenced his activity to get uh, Jews uh, documents to work in his factory. Now, 
Was he entirely altruistic here? No, no, it was cheap labor. And he needed that in his factory. Schindler was also, how do I say this delicately, he drank a lot of alcohol. And I wouldn't want him marrying my daughter. He was a pretty persistent womanizer. But, as I like to say, a person is always greater than his or her most noticeable shortcoming. And that's been one of my, one of the pieces of my philosophy of life. The other one is, no one does no thing for no reason. The second thing is, what I just said to you, a person is greater than the most noticeable shortcoming. And I thought you might enjoy this. Schindler, in uh, 1962, when the Avenue of the Righteous Among Gentiles uh, was constructed, he was one of the first who had a tree planted there, a carob tree. And there you see him, if you can see the photograph, um, digging the place for that particular, that particular tree. Motivation number three, concerned professionals. What Fogelman discovered was that if you found someone who had a similar profession or occupation as you, then there was a kind of collegiality that might prompt you to try to help. So Professor Gardner, a professor might try to help a Jewish professor, or I know we have some attorneys here and some doctors, so a, you know, a doctor would try to help a fellow doctor who was Jewish, or an attorney would try to help a fellow lawyer who was Jewish. Um, and they were ideological opposed to the Nazi uh, regime, and so sometimes it was a combination that they saw a fellow a collegial person in a profession and they identified with them. It could also be they had an opposition that was very strong to the Nazi party. An example of this would be Raoul Wallenberg. I'll say something about him again just to remind you in a second. But this group was about 5% of the interviewees that uh, Eva Fogelman studied. And there's Raoul Wallenberg. You may remember he saved an incredible number of Jews. In fact, the avenue that the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. is located on is a Wallenberg Place or Wallenberg Avenue, right, in honor of him. Probably estimates 100,000 Jews. He probably saved all together. And he did that as a Swedish diplomat and businessman and entrepreneur. He got them Swedish passports. And then he said, the embassy is a safe haven. And so come to that embassy. But then there wasn't enough room, so then he, he bought and he rented apartment buildings. And he thrust these Jewish persons in there and he said, this is Swedish territory, so they are safe from being expelled and taken away to the concentration camp. So, Rabu Waller. A fourth motivation, if you're with me, we kind of have a morality, we, we have a professional identification. Uh, number four is network rescuers. That is, there were persons who, because they were part of an extensive network, they rescued Jews. And, well, sociologists have long taught that ideology can only be defeated by a group effort. And so an example would be the Bielski brothers. We talked about them, and I'll show you a picture of them in just a moment. The Russian resistance would be an example of that. The French resistance around the village of Le Chambon in southern France. In other words, the village was saving Jews, but there was also the French underground in that area, and they were saving more Jews themselves. Network rescuers could include both Jews and non-Jews. For example, the, the Bielski brothers were Jewish, but there were other persons who were not Jewish who were saving Jews as well. So here's a famous photograph of Tuvia Bielski there in the center of the first row and his brothers, um, Asael and, what was the other one? Um, let's see, Tuvia, Asael, and, and a third brother who together pioneered this effort and saved uh, thousands of Jews by hiding them in the uh, Nabioki forest 
that was in at the time um, uh, Belarusia. So, as I said to you before, because I want to save some time for conversation with you and questions, everything's not always so neat and tidy. And so there can be some overlap among the motivations. And a good example of that is Chune Sugihara, the Japanese diplomat in Lithuania. We already discussed him and his wife, uh, Yukiko. He held all three types of number one moral motivation, ideological, religious, emotional, and then he cared about Jews, number two motivation, Judeophilia, because he had friends there who were Jewish, and I'll say more about him. Whoops, no, I won't. I'll back up for a second. Chune and his wife, Hiko, are largely unknown in Japan today. When I was a student there, everybody knows Ryokan, the famous poet from the 19th century. I mean, little kids up to adults all read the poetry of Ryokan. He's an icon uh, in, in Japan. Hardly anybody knows about Chiune and Yukiko uh, Sugihara. And that's because he saved uh, several thousand Jews. And he did that by getting them documents that would get them out of Lithuania into Russia, take them across Russia to Japan, and from Japan, they could go to Palestine, they could go to the United States, they could go to the, uh, the Dutch island of Kirikou in the Caribbean, etc., etc., etc. And he had to write those out in Japanese characters. That takes a long time to do. And 18 to 20 hours a day, he was writing those particular documents. Well, why was he doing that? Well, part of it was he had a sense of right and wrong that was a part of his upbringing. He was from a family that was Bushido and Samurai, so he had that. Religiously, he was Eastern Orthodox. His first wife, not Yukiko, but another woman, was Russian, and she was a practitioner of Russian Orthodoxy, the third branch of Christianity, right? Got Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy. And so that was the case. And emotional, because people lined up outside his office as far as he could see, wanting to be able to get documentation to escape, not to help them at certain death. And so he worked tirelessly, tirelessly to be able to help them. His wife, Kiko, would assist him by massaging his hands because they got so cramped from writing all those Japanese characters, right? She wrote a book called uh, Visas for Life in which she talks about that particular experience. A and the pain of it, because remember that Japan and Germany were aligned during the Second World War. So when Chiune came back to Japan, he lost his job. He lost his job. Fortunately, he was pretty creative and he developed an import company and he did not die uh, penniless um, the way that Oscar Schindler did, for example. But he was stripped of all of his diplomatic uh, titles and ranking because of what he did. Uh, the Japanese government knew what he was doing and he simply ignored the telegrams when they sent those to him that the, the, the cease and desist. He just simply, I never got those. I never got those, but they knew he did. So when the war was over, he certainly was stripped of his uh, governmental yeah. status. And lastly, he cared about Jews. That is the category of uh, Judeophilia because he knew Jews in the capital city of Lithuania. And he'd gone to dinner with them and he had social associations with it. So the, the, the categories are not mutually exclusive. There's overlap among them, and Chiune uh, Sugihara is one of the best examples of which I can think of that kind of multiple motivation uh, to do good in the midst of evil. Well, now we come to the last slide and then we can talk. One of my favorite sayings, you've seen it in some previous presentations, it's from 
one of the 15 books that make up the Talmud, that is the rabbinic commentary on Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and it says, the person who saves one life in a special way saves the whole world. Well, enough for me, let me hear from you. What are your reactions, your questions, your comments? And, and, and I would say this about that. You and I were talking about this before the presentation. I've spent a lot of time studying the Holocaust. I spent four whole summers at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. During my sabbatical year, I was at Gottfried Shem in Jerusalem. This has been a passion of mine for a long time. When I lived in the Netherlands, I went to the Anna Frank house, when I met Corey Ten Boom from um, The Hiding Place. You know about Corey Ten Boom, we talked about her. It's been a big passion of mine. But I don't know everything about the Holocaust. I just don't. There was a great question as an example that, that I hear from you. This past Sunday, one of our members of the presentation said to me, you know, I think I read that some of the soldiers in the German army, the Wehrmacht, were encouraged and allowed to have sexual intercourse with German women to try to increase the numbers of the pure Aryan race. Cliff, have you heard about that? And I said no, and I teased him, and then I said, I'm concerned about the literature that you are consulting. <laughs> Research sometimes enables you to learn something very interesting, right? You, you may remember uh, uh, Tina Strobos that I brought up to you as a person that nobody knows about who was a Dutch medical student and she hid uh, Jews, about a hundred of them over a period of time in her grandma's house in Amsterdam. Remember that? And I said, Every, uh, a lot of people feared the Gestapo, but everybody feared my grandmother. Remember that story? Right? Well, that was one of the positive results of research, right? You find out something is delightful. So when I was asked that question last Sunday, I, I thought, I don't really answer that. And so I did a fair amount of research. And sometimes the research affirms things that you wish weren't the case, but it just does. So here's the answer to the question. And when I see that person, because I don't see him here tonight, I'll see him on Sunday, I'll tell him as well. But you already know the answer. And that is, in 1935, Heinrich Himmler, right, who was in charge of the SS, the Schustafel, the, 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 the private army of Hitler, and was the head of the secret police. He hadn't founded the secret police, right? Goering had done that, but he inherited it, so he headed up the secret police. He started a program called Lebensborn, in which not people from the German army, the Wehrmacht, but persons from the SS who were officers, were encouraged to have sexual intercourse with maidens of Germany specially selected for the task it was an honor for them to become pregnant by them to increase the numbers of the pure Aryan race. So in that instance, this, the research confirms something that I wish were not the case, but it is. So research can lead you to things that are delightful and also to things that are very distressing. And there it goes with research. Now, enough for me. I want to hear from you. What questions do you have? What reactions? Far away, please. Uh, where were most of these rescuers located? Germany, Poland? Oh, what a great question. Did you hear me say, where were most of these, or the majority of these persons located as rescuers? Spread all over, but because the Jewish population of Poland is so extensive, a lot of them were in Poland. A lot of them were in Poland. Now, that doesn't obscure the wonderful work of Le Chambon in France, right? Or some other folks. Uh, who resisted, the Dietrich Bonhoeffers and other folks in, in, in Germany, per se, the, the Martin Niemöllers, you remember these names we talked about before, right? They came first for the communes, and, and then they came for me, no one's left us, you remember that? So, there was widespread, but it was chiefly in, in Poland, yeah. More questions, more questions. You know me, I enjoy the discussion with you the most of all. 
Could I ask you? Please. Most of the rescuers you've talked about lived in Europe and the different countries, whether it was uh, Holland or France and or different, you know, the countries that were there. Were there any people, say from the United States, heard about the atrocities taking place that went to Europe to try to be rescuers to do what? What a great question. He said, a lot of rescuers were from European countries. Were there some from the United States? And the answer is, the answer is yes. The best example is Barry and Fry. And the attention has come to him probably in the last, uh, the last 10 or 15 years. There's a wonderful film out that's called Barry's War. I don't know whether I listed that one in there or not. Uh, I could have listed so many. That's an excellent thing. And the other uh, source that you might find interesting to read um, is simply called um, Varian's War. It's a book, and it talks about the things that he went through. So were there other Americans who went? There probably were, but Varian Fry is the one who is the front runner. He's the headliner, and uh, people spend a lot of time talking about him. What about groups or organizations within the United States? Oh, great. A uh, follow-up question. What about groups in the United States? Yes, um, there were persons, especially Jewish organizations. For example, I mentioned Wallenberg. Where did he get that money to buy those apartment buildings so he could put Jews in there and then declare the apartment buildings Swedish territory so that the Germans or others couldn't take them? He got some, but not all that money from, uh, from groups in the United States. Um, there are certain uh, Jewish groups that are concerned about Jews worldwide, and they had some moolah, they had some money, they had shekels, and so they contributed to that. Um, in fact, my rabbinic friends, my rabbi friends, like to say, if a Jew anywhere in the world cries out, American Jews say, ouch. In other words, there's this kind of connection. I mean, we Christians have it too, right? I mean, we Christians think about our brothers and sisters who are followers of Christ in other places. But the Jewish sensitivity and sensibility is e even greater, I think, than ours as Christians. So if there's a Jew that's feeling pain anywhere in the world, Jews in the United States cry ouch and they, they support that. I mean, how's it been the case that Russian Jews, for example, have been able to emigrate to, especially Israel, but not just, uh, just not Israel, but other places through efforts of um, uh, Jewish organizations in the United States. And then there were groups like the Quakers, for example, the Society of Friends, who uh, contributed money as well. What I don't know a lot about is whether uh, we Presbyterians contributed some sizable amounts. That would be an interesting research topic for me to undertake. But yes, there, there, was, there were very, but at the same time, i got to tell you, there was also strong, fervent, anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States as well. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who was very sensitive to what Barry and Fry wanted to do, and got him that passport that got him to Marseille, because he, he was fluent in both German and French, by the way. So, and he got there, and he did his work and saved 2,000 Jews. I'm afraid that FDR, even though he had some good things that he undertook, he was not known as a very pro-Jewish person. And the Nazi party had some strength in the United States of America during the Second World War. And it's painful because I, I like driving those Ford automobiles and uh, Henry Ford was also a pretty virulent anti-Semite. And remember, he was the one who published in his newspaper, the uh, uh, Dearborn Independent, the English translation of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, which was a very anti-Semitic book, the charge that Jews wanted to take over the world. So we had some good things going from our side of the Atlantic over, and we also unfortunately had some bad stuff. Yeah. Long answer, but a good question. What else? What else are you thinking about? What else can I try to address? Yes, sir. What's the closest thing to the Holocaust? that has happened 
Oh, oh great, great question. So what's the closest thing to a Holocaust that has happened? You know, I, I, I gave a lecture at Orlando University, and the objective they tasked me with was to try to say, try to answer the question, well, why should we remember, and how should we respond? Think about that. Holocaust happened. Why should we remember, and how should we respond? And part of what I said was, it's often been said, we remember because we don't want that to happen again, right? And the old George uh, Santayana, the philosopher from Madrid, Spain, who said, if we don't remember the past, we're doomed to repeat it, so never again. Well, Holocausts have happened again. And therefore, your question is a very pertinent one. So if you start thinking after the Holocaust from 1933 to 1945, what kinds of things were happening? A, a lot of things were happening. Probably one of the most painful ones for me would be the Rwanda genocide of 1994. In, in three months, a million people died. That was a third of the population. A third of the population in Rwanda in the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And what I take away from that is, Remember how Jews were called lice? They were called rats. They were called cockroaches. Guess what? The Hutus were called by the Tutsis in Rwanda. They were called cockroaches as well. Or cut down the tall grass because Hutus were taller than Tutsis. So what's the message I get? And I'll say more about this on Sunday. The message I get from that is <clears throat> Whenever we're prepared to dehumanize people, to reduce them to the status of a low life, bad things can happen to them. And since the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, yes, there have been other instances as well. You can just start thinking of Darfur uh, in 2003. You can think of Bosnia and Herzegovina. You can think about, you can think about, you can think about. So we've not prevented them. But I said it in my lecture at Lambda, the last statement I said was basically remembering the Holocaust and trying to respond to it won't necessarily guarantee no more Holocaust. We can't guarantee that. What we can guarantee is that we will not remain silent in the face of injustice and murder. And I think that's one of the messages I'll try to hit upon this coming Sunday. So yes, unfortunately, there have been other genocides or holocausts since that time. Boy, that, I, that, that depresses me. But ask me another question. Yeah, please, sir. They also had a holocaust in Cambodia. Yes, well, he just made an important comment that uh, there was also a holocaust in Cambodia uh, in the mid-1970s. Pol Pot came to power, and he, he just killed a bunch of people. And if you wore glasses, he killed you because he viewed people who wore glasses to be the intellectual. So I'd have been dead, you'd have been dead. I'm looking for your glasses, uh, you have yours there in your hand, you'd have been dead, just based on the fact that you wore, you wore glasses. And I did, uh, some of you know that my, my hobby is archaeology, and I did archaeology in Cambodia, and still to this day, there are areas where you cannot go because of all the landmines that are still there. And the late Princess Diana, from England, uh, spearheaded some efforts to try to assist people who had been maimed by those landmines going off and also to try to uh, defuse the landmines. But you're absolutely right. Pol Pot's Cambodia, also definitely um, a genocide. A genocide. But we might ask today, not wanting to get too political on you, Vladimir Putin and the Ukraine. Other questions? Or are you, are you done in? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you're done in. Yes, please. The psychological experiment, the Milgram experiment that tried to understand why German officers were so complicit. What should we take from the results? Uh, okay. Did you hear that question? Because the comment and question is a really important one. 
There were some experiments done that were called the Milgram experiments. And what they did, they took some persons into a room and they basically said, you can control the level of electric shock that's going to impact a group of people in an adjacent room. And on the dial, it had different levels of electric shock. And it went all the way up to a red area, like the, 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 the tachometer in my car. It gets above, what is it, 6,000 RPMs, and then I better watch out, you know? Okay? So they had an authority figure who was telling these persons to do an extensive and, 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 and higher level of shock to people in the adjacent room. And you know what happened? They did it! The dials, they turned all the way into the red area. And why? Authority. Authority. How do you resist authority when it's got a stranglehold, a stranglehold on you politically? Or it's squeezing you economically? Or social acceptance, right? Here I'm kind of thinking of bullying which is rampant in our school systems, right? The notion of authority. And one of the things I think we can take away from this is that sometimes Christians as a group and Christians as individuals, we have to resist authority when it is not pressuring us to do things that are wholesome and healthy for other people. So, Authority. And when Hermann Goering, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, right? Yep. And was also the guy who engineered Hitler's plan to prepare for battle. He had like a four year plan to get Germany ready for 1936, 1940. Hermann Goering was the guy who ran that, right? So now he's at Nuremberg for the Nuremberg trials. He's being tri tried as a Nazi war criminal. And you know what his answer was? And they said, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? He said, I was just following orders. I was just following orders. When you go to the campus of Harvard University, that's some other school that I played against when I played for another school in the Ivy League. <laughs> when you walk in, when you walk in, when you walk in, there's a, a saying about one of the gates. And it says, basically, question everything. <laughs> or be, everything is suspect. I can't remember it exactly. I was too busy beating them on the basketball floor. But, sometimes. But it said, like, be suspect, you know, everything is worthy of suspicion, you know. That's what we got to do. I think as Christians, we have to be willing to take a look at things based on what we know to be the case as Christians. And if people are encouraging us because it's politically expeditious, it's economically rewarding, please remember the theologians and the clergy in Nazi Germany got paid to be pro-Hitler. They got stipends if they were pastors and priests. And the theologians were encouraged and rewarded if they, if they Aryanized Jesus. That is, if they, if they made Jesus not Jewish and made him be a member of the Aryan race. So that was economic incentive. There was a kind of economic authority. So I think we have to be very, very careful in terms of how we respond to authority. And that comes out of the Milgram experiments. Like people like you and I were put in that room and people in positions of authority said, turn that up. And instead of saying, no, I'm not gonna, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. They did it because they were told to. We have to be very conscious of that. Anything else? Well then, usually we are so busy and we even push beyond seven o'clock that sometimes I don't give a really long prayer at the end because I know you're itching to get home, but I will give a long prayer, but let's pray together as we Great from this evening's presentation. Gracious God, the creator of the world,
and the one who came incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth so we might be able to live life abundantly. And the one who comes in the Holy Spirit to motivate us to try to be good people and to do the best we can. We all grew up singing the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children of the World. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So many inspire us, poke us and prod us, lure us, entice us to love other people, to recognize their differences, but not separate ourselves from them, and certainly not to both them as inferior. Because they are your creatures, the work of your hand. May we speak up, and speak out, when we need to, out of love. Love one another as I have loved you. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you for being here. You're always a lot of